Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, it's great to meet you. Where are you coming out of? I'm coming out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. Cool. How about yourself? I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. You've had some you had a cold spell. Is it break yet? It's yeah, it's now it's raining, all the snow's melting, so we're gonna be in Noah's Ark land here soon. <laughs> Same here. It's 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 basically a big huge swath, but yeah, I understand you guys were super cold for a while there. Yeah, that did you are you a football fan? Did you see the game? I did, yeah. That was crazy. Great game. Great it, game. Wow, the Chiefs really uh man, they 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 came through when they needed to, huh? Well, I'll tell you what, this might be an indication. I popped a blood vessel the other night. I was <laughs> Oh wow, I see. <laughs> but at least it's Chiefs red, so it's good. But <laughs> it's gotta support the team however it takes. You. That's right. I hear Lions fans, it's all blue. So uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, the, the Lions fans have to be going nuts after oh, so God. long of a drought. I got emotional that first win because I, I just watched the Barry Sanders uh documentary. Yeah. And you know, he was so good. He did so many things. And I had no idea how much woe. And there's a lot about Detroit that reminds me of Kansas City. It's blue collar, faithful fan base, hasn't won for a long time. So I would love to to see, you know, them at least go to the Super Bowl. And if we go, if that happens, if they beat us, say la vie, you know, it's all good. Yeah, the Niners are going to be a tough out, but we'll, I'm rooting for the Lions there for sure. They've been not, Niners have been there plenty of times. Let's get the give, give the Lions a chance, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, you know the Niners just always seem to me to not have this solid face. You never quite know who the quarterback is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's this kind of shadow monster, so to speak. You know <laughs> they are, but you know they got McCaffrey. They got their defense is insane. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. it's. It's good. Well, man, it's great to meet you. And I want to begin our conversation with living through the last three and a half years. How did you get through the pandemic and how did it change you? Sure. So it definitely affected uh, the way I do, did business, of course. Uh, we had to move away from in-person meetings and and uh, I, I'm a hands-on kind of person. I'd rather be in the same room with the person I'm talking to. Uh, whether, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching or facilitating a group discussion of some kind, I, my my business is a people strategy strategy consultant. So uh, we're talking about the getting the right people and the right seats on the bus, and and you know helping develop and and really all four aspects of of the people strategy, which is uh, uh, attraction, selection, retention, and development. And so I, I consult and help. I have tools and tricks that help people along those lines. And so I wasn't doing so much of that during the actual lockdowns and all of that. Then as time, the effect of, of the pandemic is people are far more comfortable doing what we're doing right now. And so what I've shifted to is really kind of liking that and, and wanting to not necessarily work where I happen to be, but really expand to work anywhere in the world. And and so I'm moving my business and my lifestyle towards the uh, direction of being a digital nomad where I can just be wherever and yeah. do my work and it doesn't matter. So that's that's how I've shaped my business. And the last few years, I've been working on the Eye of Power model and, and I've started another separate company. Up to that point, I was a consultant. To, my company was me. And now I have a system that I want to have work independently of me. So that's been the biggest shift lately, Joe. So... Let's get to the heart and soul of what you do on a daily basis. I'm yeah. going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders. It's career day. And one of the kids is curious and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? So for that level of audience, what I would say, have you ever wanted to do something, decided to do it, and then you weren't able to do it? And then most people, I think third graders included, will say, yes, of course. I, I wanted to do this. I didn't do it. Or I... I, I wanted to stop doing this and I'm still doing it. And I, and I'll, I'll say, why, why can't you just decide and then just do it? And the person might look at me saying, I don't know. Good question. Right? Yeah. And, and the question is, and the answer is fairly complicated. It's a simple question, but a complicated answer. And uh, the main answer is it's something in here but it's really more complicated even than it's not even an intellectual exercise because it turns out that we are far more complicated creatures than what is convenient for us to actually think about. Uh, we're more like the iceberg. We think we know ourselves, but all we really know is the iceberg uh, that shows above the water. 
And we don't really know that portion of ourselves that remains hidden from ourselves, from, from, from our view. And so what I do, especially with the eye of power, is help illuminate those places that are under the waterline because the actual answer to that question of why can't you decide to do something and do it is because we're not congruent. We're not lined up. Parts of us want this. Another part of us wants something else. And we're not willing to sacrifice this to get that. And we're not clear as to how to get all things lined up so that we can just do and act. Now, we all experience times when we are clear and when we do, and then we make the decision and we do it. And that's when all those things happen to line up. So what I do is I help people line those things up deliberately so that they move faster and more uh, in the direction of their choosing rather than what might be rather, it could be super circumstantial. Yeah. So what did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream? Uh, rock star. All right. I wanted, I wanted to be a, a, first it was a rock star. Then it was um, a producer when I realized, you know, I don't, I'm not really good enough uh, good looking enough. I don't have that kind of personality to be a rock star. Now, I, I, I turned into a drummer, but I didn't start drumming till I was 25. Okay. Uh, but but um, I, I decided, okay, I wanted to be a record producer, but it was along the range of music. Uh, music's been a passion of mine since the very beginning. And uh, so, this, so it, and it actually did sort of form my, my path along my professional way, even though I've never really worked as a full-time musician or or a, or a producer or anything of that nature. Yeah. So let me ask you this. What was one of the first shows, live music shows you saw that just blew you away? So I had some big ones early on. I'd, I'd say the one that was a formative experience for me was in um, 77 or 78, I saw the Rolling Stones in Philadelphia. Opening for them were Foreigner, touring their first album. And Peter Tosh, of all people, who was on the same record label as as uh the stones yeah and so 75 80 000, mainly white kids were not really into reggae at the time so peter tosh didn't do well he was booed and people didn't like him uh, he was fantastic i'm sure but i wasn't into reggae at the time i i was i was young and i so but foreigner blew me away and of course the stones that was in their they were still in their height of their powers at that time, and it, it, yeah. it was insane. So that yeah. was one. Then shortly thereafter, I fell in love with Genesis and Pink Floyd, and those shows were just insane. Yeah. So I, I got into progressive rock, and that's been my love ever since, really. That's cool. Yeah, those are seminal shows. I've never seen The Stones. I've heard nothing but just high energy. Just the whole thing is crazy. It was pretty amazing. And and uh, the only other band that, that I've seen that can rock like that, I'd say, is Aerosmith. Aerosmith Live. I don't know if they can still do it. And maybe they can. But Aerosmith Live oh. back in the day, they it was better than the, like just you like the songs more than if you just heard the records because they, I'm going to start crying how much power they put into their music is insane. Yeah. So, yeah, I saw them back in the 90s and they filmed a video, I think Blind Man Walking. It was at the end of the show and all this confetti is raining down and Steven's yelling, hey, everybody, we got a treat for you. We're filming a video here and everybody went nuts. Oh, but cool. It, they, they, the energy was still very high. So let me ask you this. Let's go back to where you were born and raised. How did these seeds become who you are? You're obviously very driven, very people oriented. You want to in, induce change into people. How did this happen and grow into you? That's a really... I haven't thought too much about that question lately, but uh, I was born in England, but but we moved before I could talk. We moved when I was still like two years old, so I don't remember it. I saw you know videos and photos. Uh, we moved to the um, the uh, to Ohio. We lived in in uh, Port Clinton, Ohio, and Mentor, Ohio. So my first memories are along Lake Erie, and um, then and my dad worked for a company called TRW. Then TRW moved us to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and so that was in 74. So most of my my formative years, I went to high school uh, in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. After that, I went to school in Boston and uh, lived in D.C. for a while, then been back here since 99 in Harrisburg. So lived all around the, sort of the east. Um, the, the So moving around is one thing I'd say uh, is, is would be somewhat of a factor both my parents are from New York. My dad from the city, my mom from Long Island. Uh, my my dad's father was an inventor. My mom's father was an inventor. Two different kinds of inventors. My 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 dad's father, David Dardick, 
he invented the open chamber system. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be on a TV show coming up that's doing a, an episode on the Dardic gun, which he developed. And then he had a career that lasted into the 90s developing that that technology. My my mom's father worked for Columbia Paper and Ink and had hundreds of patents to his name. A, a lot of the the inks and papers, the mimeographs and things, he developed a lot of that. So there was a lot of inventiveness. They, they lived sort of a, both of my sets of grandparents lived what I'd call a fairly glamorous lifestyle where they were connected to famous people. They had fancy parties. It wasn't a life that I led at home, but it was one I was exposed to. So, but I also, I, I, I saw the world as what it could be, I guess is what I'd say. And so, um, and, and then throughout all that time, I, I read myths as a kid, I, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, a big reader, um, wanting to get to what's real and true. Uh, that that was a gift I just had from the beginning. And and I look at the human condition and I and I say, there's a lot of unforced error. There's a lot of things that we do that we really could choose a different path. And so I became a student of the human condition and that really formed my my intellectual pursuits over my entire life. Uh, it's really only been about 20 or 25 years that I've been doing that work full time. Yeah. But um but that's that's my passion is 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 really unlocking what's real and true and being more of our full expressed self of how we're born to be, uh, starting myself and helping other people do that. So who's been a hero for you? So the heroes for me, um, I'd say the first uh, uh, real ones are you know s some of the philosophers that kind of kind of. Well, first I started, my very first philosopher that I, that I actually knew was actually Ayn Rand with, with Atlas Shrugged yeah. and the Fountainhead. And that's that's fairly typical, right? When you're in 14, 15, 16 years old, you yeah. kind of get into that. And it's like, all this other stuff is baloney. And it's like, it's it's just pure this objectivism and, and all this kind of stuff. And it's for, sort of an empowering, intoxicating idea. And of course, there is a lot of power and truth there. But I, I don't think it's the full truth. I think it's a model. It's a It's a way of looking. Um, and and grew past that into more, um, I would say, uh, I got into like studying the Bible and understanding what, okay, what is real and true from a biblical perspective? Uh, you know, I don't think there's a greater repository of wisdom in the entire world than, than, than the Bible, regardless of what you think the history, I, you know, whether you're a Christian or uh, it doesn't really matter. The yeah, wisdom yeah. in there is just real true, and that's why it's lasted. That's why it's the 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 book that dwarfs all others. Um, and and it's there's a there's a whole lifetime of learning in there. And and uh, but but then as I got more into the profession, probably the biggest one I'd say would be Don Miguel Ruiz with the Four Agreements. That book is to me a distillation of of wisdom that is pocket sized. You can remember it. You can keep it with you. It's easy to remember the four agreements, very hard to do, and it keeps you at punk, uh, compass point north. Um, so that I'd say, if I had to pick one modern book that I would uh, say had the biggest impact on me, it would have to be the four agreements. So if you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now, who would it be? Who would you love to meet and talk to? Probably Jordan Peterson, um, yeah. because, because uh, his path to prominence uh, is I'm going to start crying because uh, it's it's pockmarked by incredible courage. Yeah. Um, and it's something that if we could just all touch in, I, I think that if we could be honest and courageous, all of us, the world would be such a different oh. place. And um, that kind of courage is... Uh, you know, it's so powerful and so, so needed. We 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 live in such fear, and 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 remember, fe courage is not having a lack of fear or not being afraid. It's being afraid and doing the right thing or the thing you know is right anyway. Yeah, that's the thing, and that's the magic ingredient right there. That's the thing that unlocks life is is saying what's true, saying what's real, be, uh, acknowledging. Um, those vulnerable parts of ourselves, being willing to to share, even though it might make you look bad or might not advantage you in a way you want. It 
it's still the thing. And I think of all the people on the face of the modern life today, um, he's the one that exemplifies that the most to me. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of drive and determination, what is that for you every day that gets you out of bed, that gets you to do the work, to help people and to evolve as a person as well? Well, I have to work at it because uh, by nature, I'd say I'm relatively self-absorbed. So um, I, I've had to move myself uh, from that side of, uh, of, of the spectrum. I'm not going to say I'm all the way to the other side. I'm somewhere in the middle now. Becoming a father was a huge piece. You know, that's that that experience is is the for, is a way to transform of caring about something more than your own self. Um, that that that's uh, you know the archetypical way that that we mature. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. It's anything that you can bite into that's that's bigger than your own sort of welfare and in, in, in your own skin and 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 expanding our 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 uh, circle of concern beyond that um for me the work that i do is i ha i've i've learned a routine so uh, i get up I, I i do a gratitude journal um first thing i have reading time my wife and i do yoga together um i right now i have i'm um rehabbing a shoulder so i do a little bit of pt in lieu of that, I'd probably go to the gym or take a walk. So I, so we've got from from seven to uh, nine or ten in the morning, um, that sort of energetic work of of getting myself ready for the day, dialing it up to to um, vibrate at a higher frequency, and then the rest of the time, uh, taking my best self forward is is the strategy. Uh, do I do it every day? No. Sometimes I have meetings. I had a meeting earlier on today. Uh, so it, it, I, it's, it's aspirational. It's not uh, dictatorial. I'm, I'm trying to move in the direction where I keep to that schedule more. Um, but I'm a work in progress, just like everybody else. Yeah. And um, if I get a, if, if a meeting uh, that I have that I was hoping for a good result, doesn't have the result I want, I can get just as much down as anybody else. Uh, and, and so I just have to work myself back up to keeping my eye on the prize and, and just being there present for a person, whoever that might be, with the faith that if I speak truthfully and, and, and have a giving heart, uh, it'll end up where it best could be and, and try not to be so judgy about it. Yeah, for sure. So professionally speaking, what's one of your best success stories of changing somebody? So I've got a couple that are that are brewing now that I'm really excited about. Um, I, I have a deep dive with a company that's that has me on retainer that we're that we're really re overhauling their entire higher people strategy. We're doing we're benchmarking all the roles in the company, and a couple of them are where the people were just not in the right seat. They uh, and neither and nobody was happy. Uh, the the, the, per, the person in the in, in the role most of all. And by having this process and having some heart to heart and get real kind of kind of discussions, it became much more apparent to the to all the people involved that hey, we got to make a change here. And some of those changes have been just really fixing big swaths of problems that you know. One of the things of the uh, in our lives shows problems. Sometimes we're just not even aware of the pain, right? It's a little bit of a pain, but it sort of falls into the background. And until you switch, you don't even know that the pain was there. And so to have a discussion that that says, oh, wow, it doesn't have to be this way and 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 open that up, that is a big thing. So later on today, I have a discussion with somebody who's in a boat like this. And uh, he's sort of later in his career and he he's not it's really it's not a fault of his own the 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 role he has is sort of being obsoleted by the movement of the of the company and that's going to happen more and more as ai and automation change the face of our workforce more and more people will find themselves in predicaments like this where what their original goals and and their skills and their their what they were excited about is no longer the rewarded thing that that the organization wants or needs and it shifts away and here I'm sort of in no man's land and what do I do what skills what shift do I have to make and to be able to come alongside somebody like that and and fill their cup a little bit saying look this is not you being a loser and obsolete right this is you having this that's not fitting here 
So all we have to do is find where this is going to have more utility in the world. Yeah. And and so it it's not like it, it's not a defeat kind of a of a thing. It's a exploration and a discovery sort of a, a a vibe. Yeah. And I think that's a much better way to handle career changes. And we're all going to have career changes. There's the world's shifting, so everybody's going to shift. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Let's let's go back a little bit. If you have a dream tonight, you run into the 20 year old version of you and you could give that young version a piece of advice uh -huh. based on the wisdom you've gained in your life up to this point. What what advice would you impart on your young version? Whew, wow. Uh, it's funny because on a uh, group that's called the Success Club, a Facebook group that I'm in, somebody who is young ask that basic question. Hey, I'm 18. I'm just going out of the workplace. What would you answer? And what I said was what I said earlier was have the courage to speak the truth. F fuel those parts of you that are real and true and, and uh, put less effort towards facades, uh, towards, towards the personas. Persona is an interesting thing. We need persona, right? Because we need to present something that's digestible to the world. So if I'm going to be somebody who is going to help you with uh, your personal power, you need to see me through a lens of uh, a certain lens. And if I would go against that lens or give you things that would confuse that issue, I wouldn't really be able to help you that well. So, so it's not that personas are a wrong or a bad thing. It's when we uh, lose sight of the fact that it doesn't define us. It's just a specific expression of us. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'd say to a 20 year old, stay with the full expression of yourself through those things. And the way you do that is honesty and courage. That's the, those are the basic things that fuel all virtues. So, um, speak the truth and do that thing that, you know, is the right thing to do, even if you happen to be afraid. So professionally speaking, what are you the proudest stuff that you've done? Well, the eye of power is the latest and greatest, and I'm de dedicating my entire rest of my career to it. So that does take the cake at the moment. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not new in the sense that the concepts that I'm embodying in it are old as people are, uh, people are but it's a, it's a path and an expression and a system that I've developed around which that I, that I think is scalable and sustainable in ways that I haven't seen anything else that I, that I'm familiar with. Um, I don't think organizations and individuals, uh, have a, a similar thing. There's things that are like it that you can do. Um, but I don't see it as something that's so scalable. Um, and, and so that's, I, and it's new. So it's, I, I, it's, I'm running pilots now, so I, it's not even out yet. So I can't, point to it and say, look at this crowning huge achievement. I'm aspirational that that's what'll happen, but I don't know that's what's going to happen. I, 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 I'm investing in that as a possibility. Um, I'd say also that it was my switch from, I used to have a company called the communication gym, which was a, we would train people in interpersonal communication. So it was like, uh, I had a business partner who was a coach and a black belt martial artist. And so he noticed that you could break soft skills in the business world down in the way that you do martial arts skills. So we created a whole system together of a belt system that you'd go through. And it was actually a very cool concept. Uh, but during the seven or eight years that we were doing that together, I noticed that um, I fell out of love with how to do things, this technique or that technique, because I, I found that people really, they need the why they need the purpose. If you, if you find out your why, you'll figure out the how. And so I kind of moved away from the training side, more to helping people connect with purpose. So that's when I started my consulting practice in 2011, uh, to, and specifically around helping people connect to purpose. Uh, because once you, once you have that burning sense, you asked about that earlier, Joe, you know, what gets me up? Once you have something like that, you're going to figure out the path. That's going that, that, to that's gonna be the, the lower hanging fruit. Yeah, for sure. So, Tom, everyone out there has this perception of you, family, friends, clients, colleagues, but you ultimately are in control. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Well, oh boy, another great question. I think I'm a truth seeker. I, I think I, I, more than anything else, that's what I put my mind to. I think I 
love people in the sense that I want them to be free to be their, their authentic self. Um, and so I, I think I'm the kind of person that will just go there. So if we talk about something and uh, it gets to be real or it gets to be something I can sense that there's something there, I'm sort of willing to go there with people. So like if I, even at a networking event or a party or something like that, I find myself in conversations that are sort of, they stand out a little bit unusual because in those sort of settings, you don't typically dive down. And I, and I, but that's where I think the fun is. And I think that life is, I think, I think getting real is where, uh, we find uh, actually where we find our meaning and find the deeper things. If you think about it, what are the best conversations you've ever had peak conversations to me? It's when we've gotten to those peeling away the little bit of the onion and getting to what's real and true underneath there and having a, a, a another person that's loving in the sense, not loving, like I love you, you know, like, you know, we have this perfect, but loving in the sense that I actually want the best for you and, yeah. and, and that I, I respect your individuality and whatever that is, is, is right. Whatever that is. So that's what I, in the sense that I say loving, that's what I mean. And so, so when we have those interactions and we have those things, I think those, I think that's close to what we're here for. We're here for each other in that way. Absolutely. So if anyone out there wants to hire you, learn more about you, how do they do that? I have power.com is the website. My, uh, I have a podcast that I host too on I have power podcast, which talks about these topics that are around the model of the eye of power. Uh, it's, it's all around the idea of if I wanted to decide to do something and can't do it, that third grade question, why, yeah. um, we examine those things and go in deeper dives around that sort of idea. And lately I've gotten into the, uh, format some because for the for the first 80 plus episodes it was just me talking and now i'm getting i'm adding to that by having conversations so yeah. things like what we're doing right now where we're talking you know i, I the focus would be on you and we talk about like the, what you're doing to me only i would be trying to find out okay what are the things that freed your power what are the things that you got past what are the things that people could take from and 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 be inspired by a specific action that sort of thing so yeah. so that's what the podcast is about um and, and then uh the the website uh is um, building a community of people uh that can do this work together and um, i'm looking for pilot program uh, installations and organizations that kind of thing so those are the things yeah. uh, that I'm focused most on, yes. I love it. I love this whole mission of truth and courage, and it just emanates from you. Tom, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you for you. taking a minute out, and have a great new year. Thank you. My, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Great, great questions. Great energy. I love it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a good day, man. You too. Take care. All right. Bye now. See ya.